the experimental theory of knowledge. From the preface, an elaborate preface to a philosophic work usually impresses one as a last desperate effort on the part of its author to convey what he or she feels they have not quite managed to say in the body of their book. Dewey um, was a big proponent of pragmatism, the pragmatic phrase of the newer movement. Pragmatism as epistemologically nominalism, psychologically voluntarism, cosmologically energism, metaphysically agnosticism, ethically meliorism on the basis of the bit ham utilitarianism. It is better to view pragmatism quite vaguely as part and parcel of a general movement of intellectual reconstruction. The conquest of the sciences by the experimental method of inquiry, the injection of evolutionary ideas into the study of life and society, the application of the historic method to religions and morals, as well as to institutions, the creation of the sciences of origins and of the cultural development of humankind, how can such intellectual changes occur and leave philosophy what it was and where it was. The age of Darwin must feel some uneasiness until it has liquidated its philosophic inheritance in current intellectual coin. Those who are concerned of ignorant contempt for the classical past of philosophy, elaborate and imposing system, the regimenting and uniforming of thoughts, are at present evidence that we are at a stage of performance Tentatively, the reconstruction of our stock notions proceed. Part one of four concerning John Dewey's experimental theory of knowledge. It should be possible to discern and describe a knowing as one identifies any object, concern, or event. It must have its own marks, it must offer characteristic features. As such, so as a thunderstorm, the constitution of a state, or a leopard. In the search for this affair, we are first all of desirous for something, which is for itself contemporaneously with its occurrence, a cognition, not something called knowledge by another, and from without whether this other be logician, psychologist, or epistemologist. The knowledge may turn out false, and hence no knowledge, but this is an after affair. It may prove to be rich in fruitage of wisdom, but if this outcome be only wisdom after the event, it does not concern us. What we want is just something which takes itself as knowledge, rightly or wrongly. 1. This means a specific case, a sample. Yet instances are proverbially dangerous, so naively and graciously may they beg the questions at issue. Our recourse is to an example so simple, so much on its face, as to be as innocent as may be of assumptions. This case we shall gradually complicate, mindful at each step to state just what new elements are introduced. Let us suppose a smell, just a floating odor. This odor may be anchored by supposing that it moves to action. It starts, changes, that end in picking and enjoying a rose. This description is intended to apply to the course of events witnessed and recounted from without. What sort of a course must it be to constitute a knowledge, or to have somewhere within its career that which deserves this title? The smell, M primus, is there. The movements that it excites are there. The final plucking and gratification are experienced. But let us say the smell is not the smell of the rose. The resulting change of the organism is not a sense of walking and reaching. The delicious finale is not the fulfillment of the movement, and through that of the original smell is not, in each case, meaning is not experienced as such. We may take in short these experiences in a brutally serial fashion. The smell is replaced and displaced by a felt movement. This is replaced by the gratification. Viewed from without, as we are now regarding it, there is the smell, a felt movement, and the gratification. But from within for itself, it is now. The smell, now the movement, now the gratification. And so on to the end of the chapter. Nowhere is there looking before and after. Memory and anticipation are not born. 
Such an experience neither is, in whole or in part, a knowledge, nor does it exercise a cognitive function. Here, however, we may be halted. If there is anything present in consciousness at all, we may be told, at least we constantly are so told, there must be a knowledge of it at present, present at all events in consciousness. There is, no, so it is argued, knowledge at least of a simple apprehensive type, knowledge of the acquaintance order, knowledge that, even though not knowledge what. The smell, it is admitted, does not know about anything else, nor is anything known about the smell. The same thing, perhaps, but the smell is known, either by itself or by the mind, or by some subject, some unwrinkling, unremitting eye. No, we must reply, there is no apprehension without some, however, slight context, no acquaintance, which is not either recognition or expectation. Acquaintance is presence honored with an escort. Presence is introduced as familiar, or an associate springs up to greet it. Acquaintance always implies a little friendliness, a trace of we-knowing, of anticipatory welcome or dread of the trait to follow. This claim cannot be dismissed as trivial. If valid, it carries with it the distance between being and knowing, and the recognition of an element of meditation, that is, of art and all knowledge. This disparity, this transcendence, is not something which holds our knowledge. Of finite knowledge, just marking the gap between our type of consciousness and some other, which we may contrast it after the manner of the agnostic or the transcendentalist, who holds so much property and joint ownership, but exists because knowing is knowing. That way of bringing things to bear upon things which we call reflection, a manipulation of things experienced in the light of one another. Feeling, I read in a recent article, feeling is immediately acquainted with its own quality, with its own subjective being. <coughs> How and whence this duplication in the inwards of feeling into feeling the knower and feeling the known, into feeling as being and feeling as acquaintance. Let us frankly deny such monsters. Feeling is its own quality. It is its own specific, whence and why, once more subjective being. If this statement be dogmatism, it is at least worth insistent declaration, were it only by way of counter irritant to that other dogmatism which asserts that being in consciousness is always presence or for or in knowledge. So let us repeat once more that to be a smell or anything else is one thing, to be known as smell another, and to be a feeling one thing, to be known as a feeling another. Let us further recall that this theory requires either that things present shall already be psychical things, feelings, sensations, etc., in order to be assimilated to the knowing mind, subject to consciousness, or else translates generally naive realism into the miracle of a mind that gets outside itself to lay its ghostly hands upon the things of an external world. The first thing, hood, existence, indubitable, direct, in this way all things are, that are in consciousness at all. This means that things may be present as known, just as they be present as hard or soft, agreeable or disgusting, hoped for or dreaded. The mediacy or the art of intervention which characterizes knowledge indicates precisely the way in which known things as known are immediately present. The second is reflected being, things indicating and calling for other things something offering the possibility of truth and hence of falsity. The first is genuine immediacy. The second is, in the instance discussed, a pseudo-immediacy, which, in the same breath that it proclaims its immediacy, smuggles in another term, and one which is unexperienced both in itself and in its relation, the subject or consciousness to which the immediate is related. If David Hume had a little tithe of the interest in the flux of perceptions and in habit, principles of continuity and of organization, which he had in distinct and isolated existences, he might have saved us both from German um, talk and from the modern miracle play, the psychology of elements of consciousness, that under the uh, aegis of science does not hesitate to have psychical elements compound and bred and in their agile intangibility put to shame in the performances of their less acrobatic cousins, physical atoms. But we need to not remain with dogmatic assertions. To be acquainted with a thing or with a person has a definite empirical meaning. We have only to call to mind that what it is to be generally and empirically acquainted, to have done forever with this uncanny presence which 
so bare and, in, and simple presence is yet known and thus is closed upon and complicated. To be acquainted with the thing is to be assured from the standpoint of the experience itself that it is of such and such a character that it will behave if given an opportunity in such and such a way that the obviously and fright flagrantly present trait is associated with fellow traits that will show themselves if the leading uh, leadings of the present trait are followed out. To be acquainted is to anticipate to some extent on the basis of prior experience. I am, say, barely acquainted with Mr. Smith. Then I have no extended body of associated qualities along with those palpably present, but at least some one suggested trait occurs. His nose, his tone of voice, the place where I saw him, his calling in life, an interesting anecdote about him, etc. To be acquainted is to know what a thing is like in some particular. If one is acquainted with the smell of a flower, it means that the smell is not just smell, but reminds one of some other experienced thing which stands in con continuity with the smell. There is thus supplied a condition of control over the purchase upon what is present, the possibility of translating it into terms of some other trait not now sensibly present. Let us return to our example. Let us suppose that the S, or smell, is not just displaced by um, the movement, the felt movement, or K, and then by G, as we have said before, is the gratification. S represents smell, K represents the felt movement, and G represents the gratification. Let us suppose that S is not just displaced by K and then by G. Let us suppose it persists, and persists not as an unchanged S alongside K and G, nor yet as fused with them into a new further uh, uh, symbol called J. For in such events, we have only the type already considered and rejected. For an observer, the new, uh, the new symbol might be more complex or fuller of meaning than that of just gratification. But the original S, the smell, K, the felt movement, or G, the gratification thereafter, but might not be experienced as complex. We might thus suppose a composite photograph which should suggest nothing of the complexity of its origin and its overall structure. In this case, we should have simply another picture. But we may also suppose that the blur of the photograph suggests the superimposition of the picture and something of their character. Then we get another, and for our problem, much more fruitful kind of persistence. We will imagine that the final G, or gratification, assumes this form. Gratification, terminating movement, induced by smell. The smell is still present, it has persisted. It is not present in its original form, but is replaced with a quality, an office, that of having excited activity and thereby terminating its career in a certain symbol of gratification. It is not S, the smell, but a different symbol, that is S with an increment of meaning due to maintenance and fulfillment through a process. The smell is no longer just the smell, but smell which has excited and thereby uh, secured. Here we have a cognitive, but not a cognitional thing, in saying that the smell is finally experienced as meaning gratification through intervening, handling, seeing, etc., and meaning it not in a happy, hapless way, but in a fashion which operates to affect what is meant. We retrospectively attribute intellectual force and function to the smell, and this is what is signified by cognitive. Yet the smell is not cognitional, because it did not knowingly intend to mean this, but is found after the event to have meant it. Nor again is the final experience, or the transformed S, a knowledge. Here again the statement may be challenged, but those who agree with the denial that bare presence constitutes acquaintance and simple apprehension may now turn against us, saying that experience of fulfillment of meaning is just what we mean by knowledge. And this is just what the uh, the transformed S, or the transformed smell of our illustration is. The point is fundamental. As the smell at first was presence or being less than knowing, so fulfillment is an experience that is more than knowing. Seeing and handling the flower, enjoying the full meaning of the smell as the odor of just this beautiful thing. It's not knowledge, because it is more than knowledge. As this may seem dogmatic, let us suppose that the fulfillment, the realization, experience is a knowledge then how shall it be distinguished from and yet classed with other things called knowledge? Reflective, discursive cognitions. Such knowledges are what they are precisely because they are not fulfillments, but intentions, aims, schemes, symbols of overt fulfillment. 
Knowledge, perceptual, and conceptual of a hunting dog is prerequisite in order that I may really hunt with the hounds. The hunting in turn may increase my knowledge of dogs and their ways. But the knowledge of the dog, qua knowledge, remains characteristically marked off from the use of that knowledge in the fulfillment experience, the hunt. The hunt is a realization of knowledge. It alone, if you please, verifies, validates knowledge, or supplies tests of truth. The prior knowledge of the dog was, if you wish, hypothetical, lacking in insurance or categorical certainty. The hunting, the fulfilling, realizing experience alone gives knowledge, because it alone completely assures, makes faith good and works. Now there is and can be no objection to this definition of knowledge, provided it is consistently adhered to. One has as much right to identify knowledge with complete assurance as I have to identify it with anything else. Considerable justification in the common use of language and common sense may be found or defining knowledge as complete assurance. But even upon this definition of knowledge as complete assurance, the fulfilling experience is not as such complete assurance, and hence not a knowledge. Assurance, cognitive validation, and guaranteeship follow from it, but are not con consignant with its occurrence. It gives, but is not assurance. The concrete construction of a story, the manipulation of a met machine, the hunting with the dogs is not so far into this fulfillment a confirmation of meanings previously entertained as cognitional. That is, is not contemporaneously experienced as such. And to think of prior schemes, symbols, meanings as fulfilled in subsequent experience is reflectively to present in their relations to one another both the meanings and the experiences in which they are, as a matter of fact, embodied this reflective attitude cannot be identified with the fulfillment experience itself. It occurs only in retrospect when the worth of the meanings or cognitive ideas is critically inspected in the light of their fulfillment. Or it occurs as an interruption of the fulfilling experience. The hunter stops his hunting as a fulfillment to reflect that he made a mistake in his idea of his dog, or again, that his dog is everything he thought he was, that his notion of him is confirmed. Or the man stops the actual construction of his machine and turns back upon his plan in correction nor an admiring estimate of its value. The fulfilling or satisfying experience is not of itself knowledge, then even if we identify knowledge with fullness or satisfaction of assurance or guarantee. Moreover, it gives affords assurance only in reference to a situation which we have not yet considered. In other words, the situation as described is not to be confused with the case of hunting on purpose, to test an idea regarding the dog. Before the category of confirmation or reputation can be introduced, there must be something which means to mean something and which therefore can be guaranteed or nullified by the issue. And this is precisely what we have not yet found. We must return to our instance and introduce a further complication. Let us suppose that the smell recurs at a latter date and that it recurs neither as the original smell nor yet as the final um, transformed smell, but as a different smell that is neither the original smell nor the transformed smell, but the smell with something else, which is faded or charged with the sense of the possibility of fulfillment. But the new smell that occurs is aware of something else which it means, which it is intends to affect through an operation incited by it, without which its own presence is abortive, and to say, uh, just unjustified and senseless. Now we have an experience which is cognitional, not merely cognitive, which is contemporaneously aware of meaning something beyond itself. Instead of having this meaning ascribed by another at a later period, the odor knows the rose, the rose is known by the odor, and the import of each term is constituted by the relationship in which it stands to the other. That is, the import of the smell is the indicating and demanding relation which it sustains to the enjoyment of the rose as its fulfilling experience. While this enjoyment is just the content or content of or definition of what the smell consciously meant, i.e. meant to mean, both the thing meaning and the thing meant are elements in the same situation. Both are present, but both are not present in the same sense. In fact, one is present as not present in the same way in which the other is, it is present as something to be rendered present in the same way through the intervention of an operation. We must not balk at a purely verbal difficulty and suggest a verbal inconsistency to speak of a thing present as absent. 
But all ideal contents, all aims, that is, things aimed at, are present in such fashion. Things can be presented as absent, just as they can be presented as hard or soft, black or white, six inches or fifty rods away from the body. The assumption that an ideal content must be either totally absent or else present in just the same fashion, as it will be when it is realized not only dogmatic but itself contradictory. The only way in which an ideal content can be experienced at all is to be presented as not present in the same way in which something else is present, the latter kind of presence affording the standard or type of satisfactory presence. When present in the same way, it ceases to be an ideal content, not a contrast of bare existence over against non-existence, or of present consciousness over against reality out of present consciousness, but of a satisfactory with an unsatisfactory mode of presence makes the difference between the really and the ideally present. In terms of our illustration, handling and enjoying the rose are present, but they are not present in the same way that the smell is present. They are present as going to be there in the same way, though an operation which the smell stands sponsored for. The situation is inherently an uneasy one, one in which everything hangs upon the performance of the operation indicated, upon the adequacy of movement as a connecting link, or real adjustment of the thing meaning and the thing meant. Generalizing from the instance, we get the following definition. An experience is a knowledge. If... In its quail, there is an experienced distinction and connection of two elements of the following sort. Generalizing from the instance, we get the following definition. Experience is a knowledge. One means or intends the presence of the other in the same fashion in which itself is already present, while the other is that which, while not present in the same fashion, must become so present if the meaning or intention of its companion or yoke fellow is to be fulfilled through the operation that it sets off. And then we next we will go to part two of John Dewey's um, writing on the experimental theory of knowledge, part two of five, or part two of four, part two of four, so parts 